Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening on Marketplace Network and Pastoring God's Sheep. The title for tonight's show is Three Crosses, Four Graves. I'm not going to go into the, that too deeply as to the crosses because we all can understand that the three crosses are speaking of those of Calvary. The three of the four graves are those of Jesus and the two thieves that hung on the crosses. What I want you to discover is that fourth grave. God gave me the vision of three graves, four, or three crosses, four graves. And I th first thought was three, thought was three crosses? There should only be three graves. Where does the fourth grave come into play? Then it dawned on me, why did Jesus go to the cross? He was the final blood sacrifice, the final atonement for our sins. The fourth grave was the symbol of our sins being buried. They couldn't be buried with Jesus because then they would be raised with him on the third day. They had to be buried separate so that God would no longer remember them. Hebrews 10.10, 10, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, this being true, why do we insist on digging our sins back up? Are we like religions that put Jesus back on the cross? He suffered and died for us once. Stop putting him back on the cross. Let your sins stay buried in that fourth grave. I'm guilty as the next person. I'm as guilty as the next person. I find myself with the shovel in my hand ready to dig up my past sins and relive the pain and sorrow, ready to convict myself again. So when I or you do this, it is the same as telling Jesus that we don't accept his sacrifice of 2,000 years ago. We want him to do it again. The witness of John and Peter aren't believable. We want to witness for ourselves. Well, we can't witness for ourselves. The witnesses of John and Peter and the other disciples or apostles are first-hand witnesses. We can't do any better than that. We can't go back our, we can't go travel back in time to witness it ourselves. Oh. When Jesus was on the, that cross and he said, it is finished, what do you think he was saying? His life was done, yes, true, but he was saying so much more than just that. When he said, it is finished, I understand him 
to actually be saying, Father Abba, my job has been completed. Sin and Satan have been defeated. I can come home now. Think about that. Jesus was on the earth with us for 33 years. He spent that time teaching the Pharisees, teaching the Sadducees, teaching the Hebrews the word and the will of God in heaven. He gave his life at the end of that 33 years so that he could be that final blood sacrifice, that final atonement for our sins. So when you think about it, why do we really ever, why would we ever want to dig our sins back up again? I spent too many years trying to get rid of them. Believe me. <laughs> but to us, he was saying, this day, sin and death no longer have to exist in our lives. Satan no longer has power over us except that which we give him. Think about that for a minute now. We give Satan power over our lives. We allow Satan to play with our minds, to put thoughts in our minds, be it thoughts of going out and having drugs, be it thoughts of going out and having sex. It doesn't matter. We are allowing him to do it. Stop, people. Turn your lives around. Allow Christ into your lives. The sins of the world, past, present, and future, have been buried in that fourth grave. Go and sin no more. I have said a lot here, yet I have said nothing unless you have Jesus in your life as your Lord and Savior. Unless you have repented, walked away from your sins, and confessed Jesus' death and resurrection as being real. That's a lot to be expected to do. But God does expect us to do exactly that. Without Doing that, we remain in our sins. Okay, granted, he gave us a free will. We have the right to make that choice, to stay in our sins, or make the right choice and accept Christ into our lives and bury our sins to where we don't see them anymore where they don't exist anymore. They shouldn't exist to us because they don't exist to God. Go and sin no more takes me to the Bible story of the woman who was brought to Jesus accused of adultery, a crime that was punishable by death, a crime that was punishable by her being stoned. John 8, 7. 
when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse 11 goes on to say, after the, after the people that brought her to Christ left, they walked away. Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. This is what Calvary is about. Leave your life of sin. Bury your sins at the cross and live for Jesus. You say, okay, but how do we do it? You read the Bible. You then meditate on the scriptures. Then you ask God to send his Holy Spirit to be your teacher. Read, meditate, ask. Simple as sliding on ice, right? If you don't know what to read, if you don't have someone to mentor you, it will be more like falling through the ice. Accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's just the first step. You need to educate yourself, or let me rephrase that, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to educate you as to the Word of God. Most people will tell you, in order to do that, start reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Most people will tell you to start with the book of John. Good advice. But if I may, I'd like to put in my own opinion on this and suggest that you start with the first book of the Gospels, being Matthew, and read them through in order. I believe that the Gospels were put in a particular order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for a reason. Allow God, through His Holy Spirit, to give you that revelation. Turn to God in prayer as you're meditating on the words of the Bible that you read. Meditate on them. And you see something in there that grabs your attention? It's like, Lord, this was written just for me right now. Meditate on that and ask God to give you the revelation of that scripture for your life. Yes, you could ask your pastor. You could ask a friend, your parents. But they're not going to give you the correct answer. Only God, through his Holy Spirit, can give you that true revelation. Others can tell you what they think it means, but only God can tell you the truth of what it does mean. Only God can give you that revelation. But once you receive that revelation, once you have that in your heart. 
don't just hold it, just don't just hold it in your heart. When you're given a revelation, you're to, you're to speak it out. You're to tell the world the revelation that God has given you. Speak what God shows you. Help guide other people to Christ. You can guide them, only God is going to allow them to, be, to find him. Or technically, God is, or Christ, is the one that's going to find you. He just wants you to accept him. Read the Bible. Read the Gospels. Then I suggest that in order to have an understanding of the church, go to the book of Acts. Read about the day of Pentecost. Read about how the first church was started. Again, meditate on the words that you see there and ask God for his revelation to what that means today. We don't live 2,000 years ago. We don't live 6,000 years ago. We live today. The revelation is for today. This moment, this hour. Tomorrow, as you grow, as you get those revelations and you start living by them, you're going to grow. Your faith and your belief are going to grow. With that, you can keep the sins in that fourth grave. You don't need to dig them out. You're not going to want to dig them out. What you're going to want to dig is further into the life of Christ further into how you can become more like Christ. Guide others. God has given each one of us, each one of you, a gift. That gift may be of mercy. That gift may be simply of giving or teaching. Or maybe he's given you the gift to prophesy. As you grow in your walk, as you grow in your faith, those gifts are going to start coming out more and more. And God's going to expect you to use them, to practice them. You may have the gift, as I do, of administration. Now, that can start out small. It could start out as small as feeding the hungry. It could start out with you helping to move the chairs in, in your church. In my case, the administration is my ministry, my doing this program each week for each of you. Read, meditate, pray, which is another way of saying ask. Father, as I start to close, I see somebody out there in the audience that's in tears. He's understanding the revelation that you have for him 
at this moment. He's giving his life to you. Father, I just ask that he be guided into the proper church, preferably one that teaches prophecy, one that teaches the fivefold ministry. Give him the proper mentor to help him to get into the Bible, to get into the scriptures. Father, I just thank you. And I praise you for bringing this young man into the fold. I know that you are well pleased with him. Just allow the Holy Spirit, and I'm talking to the young man right now, to enter into your life, enter into you. Allow him to be your teacher, to instruct you, to allow, to let you grow in your belief and in your faith. Father, I thank you and I praise you in the precious name of your son, Christ Jesus. This has been Pastoring God's Sheep. I thank each and every one of you for joining me today. I look forward to seeing each and every one of you next time. God bless everybody. Thank you.